Hey everybody, welcome to Absolute Jason Stewart with my friend here. God, and sort of an icon in terms of being <laughs> a, a survivor in this business, actor and comedian Hank Garrett. Uh, God, we met doing a gig together. Yes. Uh, around 10 years ago, I oh, think. Oh, at, at least, yeah. Yes, and uh, I, I really didn't have so much information on you. And then as I, I got to look and read and go on the net, I just... I was so impressed. Well, thank you. I mean, I first want to start off, you were regular on Car 54, Where Are You? Right. Tell folks who you work with on that show. Oh, my God. Al Lewis. Uh, Al Lewis, who played uh, Grandpa Monster. Yes, he played yeah. Schnauzer on Car 54. He was my partner on Car 54. Fred Gwynn, Joey Ross. Fred Gwynn was also, of course, who played uh, Herman Monster on The Monster. Yes. Oh, yes. my God, yeah. Yeah, I was supposed to play the uncle. Oh, you on the, but what happened was they decided the uncle on the, the monsters on the monsters oh wow uncle fester no that no that was on a different show <laughs> but I oh that's the adams family you're right exactly my monsters mixed up with my uh adams family go ahead and so uh, they decided to go with a, a little boy instead oh my, oh my gosh yeah and it, then it was a wonderful scene because uh, we're having dinner and you see a full moon and suddenly i'm growing a beard and fangs and Lily says, oh, Uncle, go upstairs and shave. <laughs> you know? So, but it was, it would, so would have been great. you did this show for, I mean, uh, you did, God, how many episodes did you do of this show? How many years were you on Car 54? Uh, from the get-go, uh, there was only 60. We did 60 only shows. Only 60. Yeah, well, we I would kill to be on 60 <laughs> hours of television. <laughs> we were supposed to come. Oh, here you are. My God, look at this. Oh, my. Wow. <laughs> look at that. The double-breasted jacket? Yes. Handsome devil. How about that? <laughs> so how did you get that job? It was your first job because you were a cop before. Yeah, I was a cop uh, for about a minute and a half on, on NYPD. And a friend of mine who was a comic, a guy named Mickey Deems. Oh, I remember that name. Yeah, he was very, very popular. His wife was Nat Hyken's secretary. And Nat Hyken created uh, the Bill Co. Show, the Martha Ray Show, and then he was These working. These are all big shows from the 50s. Martha Ray was a major star. Oh, yes, she was. You know, uh, Phil Silver's major star. I went to Harvey Lembeck's comedy workshop with his daughter, Kathy Silver's, for years. Wow. Who was on Happy Days. God, we're going back. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, I started in the business. I started as a comic when I was 16, Man. working up in the Catskill Mountains. With Mickey Deem. Well, Mickey Deems then got me the audition to meet Nat Hyken. And I walk in, and Nat Hyken is sitting at, at his desk, and he just asked me to sit down. I did, and he said, you're Ed Nicholson. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm Hank Garrett. He said, just the kind of idiot I'm looking for. <laughs> Nicholson is the character on the show. I know you're Hank Garrett. And he hired me. And that was it. He hired me right Crazy. on the show. Yes. Yeah. You've gotten to work with some incredible people. I mean, the first thing I really want to talk about is working on Serpico with oh. Al Pacino. Now, one of my favorite all-time movies, one of my favorite Al Pacino performances, uh, probably the first film of its kind, directed by Sidney Lumet. Yes. Starring some, I mean, so many wonderful actors in this film. Oh, absolutely. How did that come about? Uh, audition. Audition. Wow. I walked in and uh, Sidney asked me, he looked at me and, and said, uh, I understand you're a bodybuilder. I said, yeah, but an actor that works out. And he said... Which was unusual in those days. Yeah, very. I started pumping iron when I was 13. I started martial arts when I was 11, only because I wanted to be a better street fighter. I was a hoodlum when I was a kid. I can tell. Look at you. You look yeah. pissed off. <laughs> Only because I'm not working. <laughs> so what was it like to work with Al Pacino? I mean, he was so, this was at the height of his fame after the Oscar nomination for um, The Godfather, after him, like, being shot out of a cannon. And in those days, when you were in a hit movie, man, you were the biggest in the world. It was so different in the 70s than it was in the Amazing guy. Now. Very sweet, very charming, and very giving. You played Malone, which was Muscles Malone, yeah. yeah. And w w tell us about your part. Uh, he brings in a guy that uh, he, he, he nails as being a rapist. 
And he brings him in to me, and he said, uh, you want to book him? He handed the rope to me, and I beat the hell out of this kid. And I hit him with a phone book after oh I kick God, him. Oh, my God, I remember this. After I kick him in the crotch. And then I say to Al, uh, to, uh, you want a piece of, hey, Serpico, you want a piece of this? And he says, no, 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 and he backs out of the room. What was it like, though, during those days? I mean, you were in Serpico. You were in uh, Amityville Horror with James Brolin. You were in Three Days of the Condor with Robert Redford. Yeah, Death Wish, Charles Ma Manson. Zero Mostel, you did a part in The Producers. Yes. I mean, my <laughs> father would be now, God bless him, would be on his knees, you know, just... <laughs> the, the Producers, you know, Mel Brooks is... Yes. Gene yeah. Wilder, I mean, just... Well, I was that, that day... Mel didn't want to speak English. He only wanted to speak Yiddish as he was directing. This is the original producers for those at home. Yes. This is not the musical or the no. musical version of the film. No, not at all. And so what happened was the only two that understood what he was saying was Zero and myself. Oh, he wow. refused to speak English. And all the grips kept coming over and saying, would you mind telling us what the hell he's talking about? <laughs> so did you th when you did the film and it was nominated for an Oscar for Best Screenplay, Yeah, I mean, that was sort of like, wow, did that sort of change your career at the time, being associated with a film like that? Uh, I, I just, it was another job as, a, as far as I was concerned. So for you, because I see, you know, d you were doing small films, big films, big parts, small parts. I mean, you were a series regular and then you did a, a, a film in, a part in The Jazz Singer. You know, with Neil Diamond, I'm guessing, and Lucy yes. Inez and Laurence Olivier. Yeah. Who did you work with on that film? Sir Laurence Olivier. Wow. And I, w I said, uh, Sir Laurence, he said, call me Larry. And he knew everything about me. Wow. And How he, in those uh, days? I don't know. But he did research on everybody he worked with. Man, what did you play in that? Uh, a cop. <laughs> And uh, with uh, Condor, I wound up winning the New York Film Critics for best fight scene in film. Wow. Yeah. Redford, there was nobody hotter. I mean, oh. in the movies in those days. Oh, wow. Look at this. That's it. Three Days of the <laughs> Condor. Man. That's with Max von Sydow? Max von Sydow. That's in Three Days of the Condor. Yeah, yeah, he was my boss. Man, oh, man. What an incredible guy. What an incredible actor. Oh. Just able to do so, the subtleness of his work is like watching an acting class. I shoot the, the a beautiful Chinese girl that's Redford's girlfriend, and uh, I'm about to fire a machine gun that I'm carrying. And he just looked at her, and he said, would you mind moving away from the window? And she looks at him, and the, the the scene between the two of them, and she says, I won't scream. And he says, I know. Ugh. Deadly. And then I shoot her. Now the guys in my neighborhood said, what, what's wrong with you? You had to shoot that girl. Come on. Whoa, she's, she was bothering you. I said, no, that's the... It's I a had. movie. Yeah. And it was directed by the late uh, Sidney Pollack. Yeah. Man. Sidney was the one who re recommended me for the award. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's just extraordinary people with extraordinary... Oh. That, there was, that was such a time in the 70s. What was it like to be involved in so many of those movies? I, it, was was a, it was a dream. Did you think it would last forever? I didn't think it would last more than a minute. <laughs> because That's I'm saying, look at the people I'm working with. And I... I, I to this day, I, s I wake up and I say to myself, my God, look at the, p the opportunities. Well, the list is Faye Dunaway, yeah. you know, Robert Redford, Al Pacino, then The Sting with Jackie Gleason, uh, part two, and Terry Garr, who I just, I don't know if you work with her, but I'm, sh I'm just yes. a super fan of her. The Sting, the, st the second one was Jackie Gleason, and I forgot who else was with him in the film. Oh, God. It was so long ago. Yeah. Uh, but just to be able to work, did you work actually with Gleason? Do you know he was a stand-up? Oh, of course. I met That's how him. he started. Yeah, and I worked a club 
and I'm in Staten Island. That's where he was from. And he said, do you ever work Crescitos? And I said, yes, I did. He said, dude, say that again. You did it just like it. That was great. <laughs> Do you ever work Crescitos? That's, that's, and I said, that's Gleason. I said, yeah. He said, what a toilet. <laughs> and he worked there all the time. That's what we used to call the shit gigs is the toilet. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I just did the improv last night in Hollywood, you know, and I'm now I'm one of the older guys, <laughs> you know, and I closed out the show, you know, and they said, God, how did you do that? I said, well, because when you're, when you, you know, the room, get, it gets late, people get tired. How do you bring the room up? I said, because it's, it's, it's a craft. It's not just something you do for fun. It's something that you learn. Exactly. And you learn how to do your craft well, so no matter what position you're in, that you'll come off looking nice. Yeah, you come off looking like a pro. Yeah, and that was such a compliment by some of the younger comics. Oh, that's wonderful. Too close for comfort. Oh. Ted God. Knight. <laughs> oh, God bless him. Jim J. Bullock is an old friend of mine. He's been on the show. Oh, really? Ted Knight from the Mary Tyler Moore Show had a very successful sitcom called Too Close for Comfort. Oh, yes, I know. Yeah, I'm just telling <laughs> the people. You, you, we're not just talking, just you and I, Hank. Oh, I, could, I thought this People was, are listening. I was wondering why you weren't serving dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about um, working with Peter Falk on oh, Columbo. Oh, God. Because he knew you, right? Uh, he had heard I, about I you. Did a, well, I did a guest on his show in New York. He had a show called Trials of O'Brien. Oh, man. That it was, was kind a of a down-and-out attorney. Long time ago. Yeah. So now, uh, I didn't know who was the star of the show. I got a call from an agent said, you want to work tomorrow? Or today, get down and uh, get into uh, a jumpsuit, and you've got to take furniture out of this guy's office because he hasn't paid his rent. So I run down, and they throw me in a jumpsuit, and I said, what I've got to do? And they said, you pick up a chair, and you're moving the chair out. And the guy says to you, where are you going with my furniture? I said, okay, action. And I grab the chair, and I hear, hey, what are you doing with my furniture? That's my furniture. I pay for it. You know, understand what I'm saying? And I turn around, and I went, that's Peter Falk. <laughs> and I hear, cut. Yes, Hank, we know it's Peter Falk. We were shooting the scene. I went, oh. And later on, I played his boss on Columbo. Wow. Crazy. Uh, yeah. God, he was good. You know what my favorite performance of his was in the film uh, Woman of the Influence, Cassavetti directed with Jenna Rollins. There is no better performance oh. of his that I've ever seen. Peter was amazing. What a sweetheart. Uh, I had a a bit of a, a situation with my, my son. Uh, my son was arrested the morning I was heading to the studio. To shoot Colombo? Yeah. And I'm seeing my son being taken away in handcuffs. Uh, and I get there, and we're rehearsing the scene, and Peter, he said to me, uh, Hank, what's wrong? And I, I, I told him, he said, you, if you want, we'll shoot around you. He said, and when you're ready, any time, if it's not today or tomorrow, whatever you say. Oh, wow. And I said, no, no, let, let's do it, Peter. What a mensch. Oh, absolutely. We're going to take a break. We're here with Hank Garrett on Absolutely Jason Stewart. Please stay with us. Don't change that channel. We've got more stuff to talk about, about Hollywood. We'll be back in just a second. Oh, my God, there's no more channels. of American women are size 14 and above. You mean they look like this? Yeah, girl. 
So then where are we in television and film? And where are we in fashion magazines and clothing stores? Yeah. So we want to help out entertainment and fashion and media. Catch, Catch the, the F, F up. up. Watch us on Plus This live every Thursday at 7 p.m. on Dinner TV. <laughs> And I'm Nicole, and we're the ladies of Suicide, Suicide Girls, Girls Radio, Radio, the world's leading BYOB radio show. Pour a glass of your favorite tipple and tune in on Wednesday nights between 8 and 9 p.m. as we discuss life, liberty, and the pursuit of free nipples. I just flash it would be kind of funny, wouldn't it? People think flashing your tits is easy, right? And it's actually kind of hard. Hi, I'm Hanny from Lady Pants, and you're watching the top 10 women who are killing it in comedy. Congratulations, number nine, Kristen Wiig. If Kristen Wiig's rise to deserve stardom has taught us anything, it's how a proud parent must feel when watching their kid in the toilet for the first time. In the eight years since joining the cast of SNL, she has managed to earn two Emmy nominations, write, produce, and star in one of the highest grossing female-led comedies of all time and star in five $150 million movies in one year. Everybody wants her and she never disappoints. She's gorgeous but awkward and has the perfect balance of bringing all of herself to every role, yet simultaneously immersing herself completely in the character. She was still playing characters named Tuck Shop Employee when she was 33, relatively dead by Hollywood standards, and at the ripe old age of 43, she is a heroine to us all. Only a few more to go. Keep watching. And we're back at Absolutely Jason Stewart with my guest, actor and comedian and wrestler and former cop and <laughs> voiceover artist, Hank Garrett. So tell me... Yes. Um, it says here you're out, you're writing a book now of your life. Yes, with your manager. Tell us your manager's name. Deanna Marie Smith. And you are. I guess you had this experience with Sammy Davis Jr. that changed your life. Oh. And I'd love to hear about that. Okay, I. Uh, I was a street hoodlum. I, I was obsessed with him oh. as a kid. Just you know, I always wished that he had bigger, better parts. I mean, for someone who was as famous as he was, singer, dancer, actor, you know, he just really never got the break as an actor that I thought that he really, really deserved. You know, the right part in something that really made him... He was limited. Really? He was limited by the business, not by his talent. Oh, yeah. I think it's being black at a certain time. Absolutely. Sammy I mean, couldn't get in a room in Vegas even though he was starring. Frank Sinatra had to go and talk to the casino people. But then it became even, the prejudice became even more under, underscored with things. And, just, and, and you're saying being people thinking that he was limited oh. when, he, when he really wasn't. No, not by, he was not limited by his talent. He no, was limited by the people. Well, we've all dealt with that Oh, at oh some yes. level. <laughs> um, well, what happened was my mother... Might stand over here. My mother and father were fruit and vegetable peddlers in Harlem. That's where I'm from. Harlem, 111th between Park and Lexington. New York City. I was on the streets. I lived on the streets. In fact, I slept in cardboard boxes at times. Why cardboard? Why is it always a cardboard box? Because that was what was available. Oh, <laughs> you always say when they lived in a box. Why is it always a cardboard box? Like because I didn't have a choice. Okay. <laughs> so, and uh, my mother went, was crying to a gentleman who was the mayor of Harlem. His, and, uh, and I was always in trouble. I was, a f I was fighting all the time. I started martial arts at 11. It's hard to see you as a fighter because you're such a sweet, soft-spoken uh, man. Well, I've learned. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the gentleman's name was Willie Bryant. He was uh, the mayor of Harlem. He came to me. I was standing on a street corner smoking with my fellow hoodlums. And he said, your mom wants me to take you out. Now, when you tell somebody in New York, I'm going to take you out, it means you're going to kill them. 
So well, I thought it was a date. <laughs> well, that's what it turned out to be, but ah! I wasn't sure. <laughs> Did I just ruin the whole joke? Uh, no, it wasn't a joke. With, I looked at him, and I'm ready to throw a punch at him, and two mountains moved toward me, his oh my bodyguards. God. And so he said, uh, I got permission. You're going to dinner with me. And have you got a suit? And I said, yeah, I got a suit. He In said, the box? Where did you keep it? Oh, no, no. Uh, I had the apartment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so I, he said, but p before you put the suit on, take a bath. <laughs> and I went, whoa. Well, my suit took me to the Apollo Theater. Oh, man. Went to dinner first, the Apollo. And we went right into Sammy's dressing room, and there were hundreds of people waiting to see Sammy. And Sammy Davis sat me down, and he said, Mr. Bryan said, you're either going to go to prison or you're going to die. And I said, that's my choice? He <laughs> said, the way you're going, yeah. Now you got to understand something else. I was packing a gun at the time. I was 13 years old carrying a gun. Man. They got I had a couple Legos. <laughs> <laughs> I would have traded with my gun for a Lego, a Lego lamb. Anyway, he said, uh, they got me a gig with an all-black orchestra, uh, and I was a band boy. And I took, what, what do I do? And they said, you put the charts and the seats out for all the musicians. And at the end of the gig, you fold everything back up and put it back. And at the end of the gig, uh, the band leader, a guy named Lucky Millinder, gave me 50 bucks. And I went... That was like a 1,000 then, right? Yes. He said, get yourself some new kicks, shoes. My shoes were torn to shreds. Mm -hmm. And so I bought a pair of Florsheim shoes for 15 bucks, gave my mom 35, more money than she had seen all month. Or a year. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, that's a lot of money. And so, days. and now I... 20-some-odd years later, I'm opening for Tony Bennett. That was my next question, yeah. Man. At 16, I'm working at Catskill. 17, I wrestled pro, but I had to lie about my age, so I had to become 10 years older, because I was 18 when I was doing Car 54. Really? Yes. How big a star was uh, Tony Bennett when you opened for him? Oh. Really huge, as big as Sammy. In terms of what was going on at that time. And also. Because Sammy was one of the first people to be on television, black guys to be on TV. Do you oh kids yeah. even know who Sammy Davis Jr. is? Oh, good. You? Oh, thank God. Uh, I was going to get scared. I, I don't know if they're lying to me or what. <laughs> they, they got these little blank looks on their faces. But uh, I was obsessed with him. I remember he did um, the Broadway show that Anthony. Uh, uh, oh, God. Uh, what was it called? Oh, God. With uh, Lola. Lola Falana. Yes. I want, I, on the world and trying to get, get off the world. Oh, look. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, um, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I can't absolutely. But he was like on everything when I was a kid. Sam was one of the sweetest guys. Uh, when To get me started, he said, here's my number. You call me if you need All six digits at that time. Thing. Oh, And if anybody was home to answer a phone. <laughs> He w I put him in my pocket, and I took him home to meet my mom. Uh, he, uh, do you remember when he was on All in the Family? And oh, sure. And Archie Bunker in the 70s, and that was like, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, because uh, uh, Archie was driving a cab and picked him up, and something had happened. He left the briefcase. Oh, and he brought the briefcase <laughs> over, yes, to the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So you also made quite a career doing stand-up and not just opening up for Tony Bennett, a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, and Tony Bennett seems like the coolest cat in the biz. Oh, he was. You know, now he hangs with Lady Gaga. <laughs> uh, uh, and she can sing. She really can That's sing. That's why he digs her. Yes. You know. What was it like opening for him? What was the experience? Oh, I, well, a line I did, opening night at the Sands. Frank's I, I, filmed the, the, I filmed Vegas Vacation the week before with Chevy Chase before they tore the Sands down. So it's our difference in our ages oh. and our careers, but we, you know, we both have experienced that. The Sands was it. Oh, yeah. It was uh, one of the biggest. Opening the, night oh at yeah. the Sands. That was like, man, if you could get at the Sands. Well, I, I was there, and it was it had about four inches of space to work because it was jammed. And I see Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Peter Lawford, and Sammy Davis Jr. sitting in the audience. Oh, my God. 
and I'm introduced and I walk out and I see all these people and I said, wow, you know how crowded this place is going to be when his fans show up? <laughs> <laughs> and Frank gave me a standing ovation. Uh, wow. and I Who else have you opened for? Oh, God, Jerry Vale. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was with him for two years. We had the same manager, uh -huh. Tony, Jerry, and myself. Oh, boy, I, I can't even recall. So many. Oh, yeah. So you've also had an incredible career. And why don't we show a couple pictures and let people take a look. Why don't we show a couple of the pictures that we have left and let us tell us about what was going on at some of these pictures. Well, this is, of course, Car 54. Car 54. Where, where are you? Fred That's Fred Gwynn, and who G became this incredible. People know him from my cousin Vinny as the judge, but he's had an incredible career oh. as a character actor. And in those days, it was so hard to be on a show, be identified and playing a certain character, like Herman Munster, and then this. It, he it did Big Daddy on Broadway, a cat on a hot tin roof. Yeah, he really was able to transform yes. one of the first. And who's the other guy? Um, Joey Ross. Who did a show with Imogene Coco called It's About Time. Yes. Where they play, <laughs> it was only on one season, and I loved it. I wish that I could see the show about cave people. The Neanderthal man. It's about time. It's about oh, space. Trace. It's about the time to slap your face or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Get, show us another picture. Oh, what's this? Oh, my God. Working with John Ritter. Oh, my God. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, Three's Company. Three's Company. He was, look at you, handsome devil. Look at, who's... Who's the other guy? Do you remember uh, that? I can't recall his name. Why do you have a picture of John Ritter? His face is covered. Oh, and I just met his son the other night. I was at um, Sundance gives an award every year to a prominent filmmaker, Nate Parker, who directed The Birth of a Nation. I'm in that film. I have a nice supporting role, and they gave him a big award. And his son was, at, was there, and I got to meet him. Uh, yeah. it, what, John, what was John like? So funny. I that's the great fortune I've had, uh, meeting the, some of the, the, the most amazing people. John Ritter was another one that was a sweetheart. Oh, yeah. oh wait, like, who's this? Kike. Kirk Douglas. <laughs> he just turned 100 uh, recently. <laughs> He's a oh, my God, Kirk Douglas. Can you do him? You can do him. No, I never did Kirk, but the funny thing is he said to me before, I, we have a fight scene. What is this? Wait, wait, what's is this? Uh, do you know what movie it is? Uh, never steal anything small. I did with Cagney. Uh, it was originally called the Pineapple Print. The Double O Kid. I don't know. No, Double O Kid was. Uh, I don't know. It's it's a million things. Anyway, he said to me before the fight scene, he said, "Look, I've got a reputation. I have never ever made contact. Action." Bam! And there went my nose. And I said, uh, not only did you screw up your reputation, take a look at what you did to my nose. Let's see. <laughs> oh, it's been it's busted a number of times. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> look at that. Type in uh, uh, Hank Garrett and uh, Kirk Douglas and see what comes up. Wow. I just love this picture and this time. It's everything with the beads and the thing. And the Is that a record? No. I, don't, I can't see what that is there. I thought it was a record, but nothing comes up. Oh. Go to the next picture. Let's see what else we got. Oh, this James Earl Jones. Now, he had his own show for a year called Paris. I don't even have to look at the I notes. was co-starring. Yes, you were. <laughs> yes, you were. James Earl Jones, Yes. who, you know, is probably one of the greatest American stage actors. Yes. You know, recent, and, and, you know they're doing Fences, the Denzel Washington the, that he did on, of course, oh. he originated the role on Broadway. Absolutely, I saw and they're him doing do Fences it. now as a film, which will come out in December. Uh, so tell us, what was it? It's a, that's a oh. whole season. How did you get that show? That because you were doing small parts, small parts, small parts, small big movie, small part, big, you know, and then all of a sudden you would get a guest star, and then you would, and, and and you you just kept working. There was no, there was no uh, thing with it, what this is your career. It was like just I'm a working Joe. And this, that was, I mean, that was a great thing at that time to be able to get on a network series. I mean, it must have changed your whole life. It did. It did. Uh, it's in 1980. I Steve Bochco. Oh, man. Had seen me in Condor. Three Days of the Condor? Yeah. Wow. And he remembered me and called me. So this is your career, dear God. People oh, yeah. calling you. Yeah. 
Stephen Bochco, who did NYPD Blue and exactly. Hell Street Blues and so many other wonderful shows. Yeah, he brought he he put us together. Well, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. Your tales, maybe some stories from the show. Um, we're here at Absolutely Jason Stewart with Hank Garrett, and certainly an icon in in the business. And we'll be back in just a moment. Please stay with us. Don't move. <laughs> I'm Money B, and you can kiss my ass. Let me swallow my snot. <laughs> that's that's sexy. Keep up the good work, mild net. Ne- oh! <laughs> <laughs> Let me see how I'm gonna come and check out. No, I love you. Oh yeah, why no cyclocyanabin. <laughs> <laughs> Switching up. My wedding band jumped out of my. Oh my god, I hope it's on omen. Call my wife. He keeps moving away. (laughs) Hi, I'm Rob Schneider, and you're watching T Hollywood V. Z Hollywood T. (laughs) Z. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna (laughs) Nailed it. It's uh, Mary Carey, of course, politically naughty with Mary Carey. I'm always naughty. I'm always politically. My behavior is always politically, politically naughty. naughty. I'm never politically correct. I'm Dr. Dr. Drew, Drew <laughs> hi. Oh, I'm so hey guys, how are you? It's all teary-eyed, doctor. I know. She wished she could live at rehab. <laughs> <laughs> but only if Dr. Drew's there. Obviously, sure. plus one, like, you know, this little too groping might be inappropriate, but I like the flirting. Well, and when I, when I, I walked in, you shoved my head in your <laughs> No! Are you going to sue me? <laughs> Get Politically Naughty with Mary Carey, Mondays at 4 p.m. Hey, welcome back to Absolutely Jason Stewart with my guest, actor, comedian, boxer, fighter, <laughs> Indian chief. Cocker Spaniel. Yes, Hank Garrett. So you were talking about James Earl Jones, and you were talking about being on his show for a year. That was So you got to be when they were TV was only three networks, and people were like, you know, TV was so, I mean, every, the minute that show came on one night, everybody knew who you were. What was that like? Amazing. Uh, I learned so much about acting, working with James. Uh, what did you learn? Of well, first of all, one of the things that there was a tight close-up on me, and so they're going to have a script girl read my cue lines, and James said, "Let me feed the cue," and he stood alongside the camera so that we could make eye contact. People don't know that a lot of times the big stars don't do that. I did a film called. Um, oh, what was it called? Ghost Never Sleep with Faye Dunaway. And uh, she did, they did her coverage first. And then they did mine. And she did not move. She was there for me the entire time. She, that's the way the pros are. Yes. You know? And that's the way it should be. I think so. But, you know, time, everybody's in such a big rush now. It, it used to be, we used to have time, and now we have no time. Yes. I don't know why. I don't know where the time went. <laughs> we just don't have any time. <laughs> so now you you you've done an incredible amount of work as a voiceover artist in uh, GI Joe, where you played Dial Tone, right? And also in in, when in Garfield, in one of the Garfield one or two of the Garfield the two characters on Garfield. Yeah, generally speaking. Oh, here we go. Oh man, Dial Tone. Yes. In fact, there's going to be a huge convention next month. 
Where is it? Where is it going to be? Long Beach, Long Beach Convention Let me Center. See where I think I got it right here. Uh, Long Beach, yes, uh, it's the Long Beach Convention. Uh, it's August nineteenth to twenty first, and you're going and you're being brought into the Karate Hall of Fame as as well as the Wrestling Hall of Fame. Yes, man. <laughs> Jesus, I just, I, I work out in an elliptical machine. Oh, yeah. And it's in my house. It's while I watch Trump and yell. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, that's, uh, congratulations. Thank this you. This is at Marshall Khan. Ma Marshall Khan is this, yeah. this weekend. And uh, for all the action work that you've done, because you've done a lot of action roles. Well, Marshall That's sort of Ma been, has been your, you know, uh, I guess, fallback in a way. And sort of made you, gave you the, the impetus to, to get other kinds of roles that you might not have gotten having been a street fighter and all, learned how to do all this oh stuff. Yeah. For me, it's a, you know it's like comedy being funny, but now I get to do dramatic things, and, and certainly you have. And so you got to work in the big sequel to The Exorcist called The Heretic, oh, with uh, <laughs> Richard Burton and Linda Blair and Louise Fletcher. I'm just shocked that I know all this. It's so <laughs> sad. And who directed it? If I'm correct, I'm not sure. Was it William Peter Blatty? Did he actually direct this I'm one? I don't recall. I think honestly. he did. Look it up. It's called uh, The Exorcist uh, Two: The Heretic. It was, and it came out. Oh God, like eight years. You know, I think in the late seventies, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I was still living in New York at the time. And uh, tell us, what was it? It was a. Uh, what year was it? It was oh, 19. Oh my God, it was 1977. So it was around five years after the original. What was the, uh, what was it like to work with Richard Burton, or did you work with Richard or Louise? Or Louise I had just won the Oscar. For I worked. Yeah, I worked for with Cuckoo's Richard. Nest. Uh, he was a passenger, and uh, Linda Blair is trying to steal his wallet uh, on a train. And I'm a conductor. I didn't have a line, but they flew me out first class from New wow. York. Wow! They paid me a huge amount of money. They sent me up for wardrobe. They made a special wardrobe for me, and uh, did they think you were gonna? W was there lines that were cut or? No, no. They just liked the look. And in those uh, days, pe actors would do that. Yes, man. And as I said, they paid me a lot of money. They flew me out, put me up in a hotel, and uh, she goes to take his wallet, and I grab her arm. And so there was acting, and it was an action, of course. Yes, and he said, "Leave her alone. She's with me." That was Burton, Richard <laughs> Burton. <laughs> yes. And Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. Elizabeth. What are you doing, my little dumpling? Yes. Right. <laughs> I love them together. Oh. Man. People don't realize, I mean, during the 60s when they did Virginia Woolf and Shakespeare and oh, all wow. these cool films and, you know, together and XYZ and Divorce His, Divorce Hers and all these films that they were doing were so edgy at that time. They would never be made by studios now. No. The VIPs and, uh, you yeah. know. How much can it make? Yeah, and it never did. Some of them were really, really uh, crazy films. I mean, very artsy and for the time, certainly. Sure. And I was uh, always so impressed uh, with their, I guess their chemistry and their and their work ethic you know in those days which is different than now oh absolutely. But people really took their time then to do things now everything is such a rush and uh and and certainly of course cleopatra uh. you know. <laughs> don't tell me you were in that too no no <laughs> you work with bronson charles bronson and death wish now it was on the other night i was that film just sort of freaked me out when oh. i was a kid never did get to meet him no, what did you do? Did you work with Hope Lang, or did you work with... Uh, no, I was a uh, construction foreman, and uh, we grab a guy. Again. Uh, yeah, of course. Beat the shit out of somebody. Yes. Push them down something, and, and someone then, screamed. And then the reporter said, uh, uh, you, you held him. Yeah, we held the guy uh, uh, until the cops came. And they said he had broken bones and the dislocated shoulder, and I, and I said... Oh, gee, the poor guy must have fell down. <laughs> <laughs> they have a close-up of old, everybody beating this guy up who was trying to rob an old lady. What was the difference between being on a series in the 50s and then being in a series in the 80s? Because, I mean, it was quite, in the 50s, everybody, well, 
<laughs> Bless you. Oh, everybody had a television set that they watched, whereas in the 80s, there was much more people watching television then. What was the difference, do you think? Uh, in I terms of being recognized? And I think of our sh the shows that we did in the 60s were so much funnier, so much better written. Uh, well, the, the 70s and 80s is when things really got really soap opera and, and very, exactly. you know, this, these really formulatic shows. I mean, now, by God, the stuff on television now is sometimes better than the movies. Oh, absolutely. But the writers were so great. Mm -hmm. The performers were wonderful. I'm talking about in the 60s because I, I run into Dick Van Dyke every once in a while and we talk about our I heard show. it's not that hard in Malibu. To yeah. see him, he's around. Yes, he is. He's ninety. Yeah, hard to believe. Did you ever work with Dick? Uh, met Dick in New York a couple of times. Who's the person that you work with that uh, that I haven't asked about that just was just fabulously leaves a really indelible memory for you? Is there somebody that you work with that you can think of that I might have left out? Redford for sure. Yeah, because we really didn't talk about him. What yeah. was it like working with him? Because he's—he was not only you know an actor in a film. He was um, pretty much produced most of the things, oh, even well if he didn't get credit as a producer. It was his company a lot of the time, especially with Pollock. Well, for example, uh, he saved my eyesight. Really? In the fight scene, where he throws coffee into my face. Now he came out of his. Do you ever get to do anything where you're not being beat up uh, or tortured? No, that's pretty much my life. <laughs> he came out of his dressing room and he saw the coffee and there was smoke coming out of the uh, pot. And he said, Oh, look. Yeah, that's it. Man. Did you guys look that up just now? That's cool. Look at these kids. They can just. That's a great shot. And you see in his hand, he's got a poker fireplace poker. Uh -huh. I just try to shoot him and he realized that I'm not a real mailman because I'm wearing... Oh, I so remember this scene. Yes. Now, was that a, on a set or a real apartment? That, that was a set. God, look how great it was. Oh, yeah. Did, what was Faye done? Did you work with Faye at all? I saved her arm. She was going to hit me with a, a uh, hand mirror. For no reason? Just because, no, no, because you were in her eye line? No, it was in the scene, right? It wasn't in real life. Yes. Oh, wow, look at this. Look, look at that hair. Man. Anyway, so she comes at me with the hand mirror and... And look at that television. Yeah. <laughs> and, she, and you saved her. Wow, because you really understood. Because she was going to hit me and I had to block the shot. Now I'm a martial artist and I come up to block the shot. And I realized she didn't have any padding on her arm. And her arm was like a twig. Right. And I said, if I do that, I'm going to break her arm. So I made sure that she was padded, and all I did was the move her rather than coming up and, and really hurry. Wow. Now, you work with John Voigt on Baby Genius. Oh, my he God. He was in it, but I don't know if, you work, I don't know if he was in any of your no, scenes. I, no, no. Love, love, love John Voigt. I work with him on a film called Eternity, produced by the same people that produced... Um, baby genius and it was basically the film wasn't eternity it should have been done in three nights but <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like, like an eternity <laughs> so tell us you also do a lot of work with the vets yes because you were a vet yourself I was well I was uh, assigned to the Marine Corps and I was frontline entertainment so I was in Still. Vietnam. I was in Vietnam if I went I don't know what I would do you know I guess I would do comedy or that's yeah. what I did. Yeah. Like, you'll appreciate this. Uh, I hit the front line, and machine gun opened up, and I started running. And as I was running, I yelled, "Critics!" <laughs> and everybody, one of the young <laughs> GIs said, "Sir, please don't make us laugh when we're trying to get out of here." Oh God. So you're writing a book now. Yes. And when is it? When is it to come out? Or it, what's what's the? Uh, uh, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And how can folks find it? Uh, contacting my, my manager. So they can also go to your website, yes. which is Hank Garrett, uh, dot biz. Dot biz. And that's two T's with Garrett. And wow. it, the book title is Up From the Sidewalk. 
up from the sidewalk because you're always being pushed down, yeah. either being hit or, you know, it's been it's been a long road. Yeah. Do you find that there's some ageism in Hollywood? Because uh, I do. I'm starting to feel that now. Oh, that sure. That seems to be the new thing. Thought being gay was a problem. Oi. <laughs> they don't like they don't like people over a certain age. They don't even do product testing for anybody over 50. Oh my God! Look at this. This is your website. Yes. Sniper, Serpico, Columbo. Basically, it's all the people you beat up. <laughs> <laughs> See, and there's James and myself. Oh, Amityville Horror. That's James Brolin. Oh, it's and that's the character I do on G.I. Joe. Oh, wonderful. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Well, it's just been an absolute joy to have you on the show. I'm Thank really, you, really excited about the book coming out. And people can probably get the book by going to your website, HankGarrett.biz. If you forget his name, just go to JasonStewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T. And, oh, my God, and this is the way you looked as a, as a, as a boy. No, that was this morning. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this man. Look at the size of your arms. I used to, uh, well, I competed as a power. I competed person. too. No one asked me, but no <laughs> one let me in. I was trying to compete. I was trying to get, I go, well, who's, wh what's that behind you? <laughs> that was done in a park. Looks like uh, a gay resort. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were a handsome devil. That's all I have to say. Yeah, the operative word is were. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Do you tell how old you are? I'm going to be 75. Wow. Yeah, October 26th. Wow. Man, so this is what 75 looks like because you certainly don't look it. I wouldn't think 75. Well, thank you. You know, I would think, uh, you know, 70. <laughs> <laughs> Not a day over. <laughs> no, you look like you're, you pretty much look like you're in your 60s. But I think that, you know, you've, you've al obviously left a lived a healthy lifestyle. Uh, we try. I'll tell you, Deanna Marie, and she's amazing. Uh, we work out together. She does yoga for an hour and then lifts weights with me for another hour. Wow. So uh, well, It sounds like there's more than managing going on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, I am very excited to have you on the show. I so appreciate you coming down and taking your time. Thank you, Jason. And, and being here, and I wish you great success with the, the awards and certainly with the, uh, with the new book. Thank and, you. And uh, if anybody forgets his name or forgets anything, you can always go to jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T, and I will put you in contact with Hank. Thank you so much for being on the My show. My pleasure, Jason. Everyone, until next week, take care. He's absolutely Jason. He's absolutely gay. He'll absolutely brighten up the darkest rainy day. He's funny and loves movies. He's smart and he's a Jew. Oh.